Good morning. Can you hear me? Great. Maybe I'll talk closer to the mic. Uh, thank you so much for bringing me here. It's a great pleasure, it's a great honor to speak at this seminar in honor of uh, Noam Chomsky. Uh, it is a great privilege for me to uh, try to speak here about the brain mechanisms for constituent structure. I think we owe to uh, Noam Chomsky in the 1950s the vision that language and to some extent mathematics would provide unique windows into uh, the uniqueness of the human mind because there was something very special going on there. And I have to confess that 60 years later, I cannot say that we have made enormous progress in understanding this system. Uh, we have, to some extent in my lab, done two uh, things. We have mapped a region with Laurent Cohen, who is here, uh, which is uh, important for recognizing individual words and gives us access to the language system through vision. We've understood that there is an area that cares about numbers in the parietal lobe. But this research has concerned single words and single numbers and has barely touched upon the issue which is critical in Noam Chomsky's work, which is the issue of how we combine these objects together to form sentences. And today I would like to talk about our first approach on this topic uh, this is work that is done in the lab together with Christophe Pallier. Um, so, uh, of course, I think everybody knows here that language is recursive. It allows the speaker of a language to combine basic elements to create nested expressions. And this nested property is absolutely essential. It can be depicted as trees or diagrams, such as this sentence here, happy linguists make a diagram. Uh, I could have used, I suppose, colorless green ideas, sleep furiously. Um, a sort of syntax is also present in many other domains of human competence. Of course, mathematics uses expressions, formulas that have this nested property, but we can speak also of music and perhaps also action plans as having a sort of syntax. And in many ways, they may be peculiar or unique to the human species. Um, and uh, this is why Hauser, Chomsky and Fitch in a very famous paper, I've postulated that maybe recursion is a uniquely human evolution that underlies all of these domains. And today, using brain imaging techniques, I would like to explore this domain and ask, does the brain contain a single recursion system? And how are constituent structures encoded at the neural level? I have to say we don't have a solution to this. So they will, they will remain a question mark. Um, but let me start with this study that we did uh, with uh, Christophe Pallier and Anne-Dominique de Vauchel, which was trying to look at the areas and the code. I think there is really a neural code problem for neuroscience for constituent structure of language. So we started with a very simple hypothesis that if there is a region of the brain that constructs trees, we might expect that its activation should increase with the size of the tree. So, um, for instance, there may be a merge operation, as in mini the minimalist program, that is needed to bind two constituents, and the more merge operations, the more activation we might expect to find in the relevant areas. There will be something like an ordering of activation for uh, this sort of nested uh, or larger constituents. Um, now, of course, in this example, constituent size is confounded with number of words, so if we did that experiment, it would be a very silly experiment, because we would see a lot of areas showing differences. Um, so what we did was to create stimuli that had a fixed number of words, but still we manipulated constituent size. And here is an example of what we did. I hope you can read these sentences. So we start with a sentence. Let me try to make this work. We start with a sentence of 12 words here. I believe that you should accept the proposal of your new associate, right branching sentence. And then we progressively deconstruct it into uh, and we chose 12 because it has many divisors. So we ca you can have two pieces of six words, the mouse that eats our cheese, two clients examine this nice couch, or we can have three pieces of four words, four pieces of three words, six pieces of two words, and finally we have a list of words down there. And you can see that the number of words is constant. We're going to use visual presentation to start with, so the display is extremely similar in all cases, and yet uh, we can construct constituents uh, at the top level in a way that you can't at the bottom. Now, there are many uh, confounds that are available here. We try to reduce some of these confounds by having a, a second version, uh, the famous Jabberwocky manipulation following Lewis Carroll's poem, where we replace the content words with uh, equivalent pseudo words, with the appropriate morphology. So that you still have the ability, using uh, the closed class words and the morphology, to understand, in a certain sense, to parse syntactically 
this sort of sentence. I perceive that you should be gapped through pupil of your true veoflet. And you can see that the constituent structures continue to vary somewhat regularly according to our parametric variation. So in this way, we control for semantics, which disappears, hopefully, more or less. The roles, of course, are still there. And uh, importantly, we control for transition probabilities. Transition probabilities are violated in the list of words, but then they are also completely violated with these non-lexical items. So here was our expectation, or our prediction, if you would like. We expected, and this was just a pure hypothesis, I have to say this is the difficulty of the problem here, that what we have is tools of fMRI and MEG that are extremely indirect tools to look at neural activity, and yet we're trying to second guess how the brain does it. What's the code for constituent structure? And I think that it's a very ambiguous problem, so that's why it's very difficult. But here is our very simple hypothesis, that when we present words, if they can be integrated into a sentential structure, then we would expect that somehow their activity would be maintained over the duration of the sentence as they are integrated together. And so we predicted that, for instance, for the six words constituent, there would be the buildup of progressive activation as new words are integrated into the structure and then collapse if you cannot integrate the new words, okay, creating this sort of triangular profile. Um, this may result, for instance, for, from a specific proposal which was made by Paul Smolensky that in areas coding for the constituent structure of language, we may see a superimposition of assemblies of neurons, with maybe with a sparse code, that would uh, each correspond to a specific merge, the binding of a role with a filler. Uh, if you want, we can discuss that in the discussion period, the specific proposal by Paul Smolensky. It's just one hypothesis. So we can't see for the moment this sort of neural response profile, which would be the total profile of activity, not a single neuron. Single neurons may show just sustained activity, maybe. But this is the total profile of the population. What we will see is the convolved activation after uh, convolution by the hemodynamic function that uh, is, of course, the way we can do imaging with fMRI. And so we predicted that we would see this sort of curves with an increasing level of activation as we vary parametrically constituent size, as well as a shift in the timing of the response because the activation comes later and later as the merging of the constituents has to come later in the sentence. A uh, few words about the procedure. There are two groups of 20 subjects, one for normal prose, one for Jabberwocky. In each case, we added six levels of constituent structure. We're doing visual presentation, rapid serial visual presentation. I like this a lot because it's a nice way to control for all of the prosodic parameters and yet still have uh, uh, the way to present a sentence in a controlled manner. Um, I will show you later replication with auditory stimuli. We use the slow event-related paradigm, which means we present one sentence, and then we wait 12 seconds before we present the next one. And that means we can track the entire profile of activation. Um, and uh, the task is also important. We wanted to study a sort of reflex of syntactic processing in the brain. So we didn't want to have any complex tasks, such as detecting violations or something like that that would create additional activity. So in order to do that, just to maintain attention of the subject, we ask the subject to listen, to, sorry, to read attentively, and simply to click a button when there is a sentence that says click a button. Um, so what did we find? If we look at the whole brain, and we ask are there areas whose activity increases with constituent structure, we find this network. It's a very organized network, comprises six left hemispheric region. We see only one of them here, the second one here in the inferior frontal region, so two in the inferior frontal region and four in uh, the uh, superior temporal circles plus the putamen in the bottom. You can see this very systematic geometrical organization which is mysterious and I think points to uh, perhaps a developmental process for these areas. What's interesting is that a subset of these regions maintain their activity without any uh, interaction in the case of presenting Jabberwocky sentences. These are the three areas that are shown in red here. Triangular and orbital part of the inferior frontal gyrus, as well as the posterior part of the superior temporal sulcus. And let me show you the profiles of activity of these regions to show you that there, there is really something quite distinct about these two sets of regions, the, the red one and the yellow ones. If we take, for instance, the posterior superior temporal sulcus, we see very clearly this monotonic increase in activation as a function of the constituent structure from the list of words here to the full sentence. And we see that two in the orbital and triangular part. Um, you can see that the two curves are parallel, meaning that Jabberwocky, which is in blue, gives 
just about as much increase as the normal uh, structures. And this is important because it means that these areas seem to focus entirely on what can be passed syntactically, but not what is the message, which is largely missing in the Jabberwocky condition. There are other areas that, on the contrary, collapse completely when you move to Jabberwocky. So the temporal parietal junction here, or the temporal pole here, you see they have a very strong increase as a function of constituent structure for normal pose, but they collapse completely, become completely flat when you move to uh, Jabberwocky sentences. So we have a dissociation here, and it's possible the areas in yellow have something to do with the construction of the uh, constituent structure of the meaning of the message, and the areas in uh, red may have to do with much more with syntactic parsing. So we begin at least to parse the system. Now we can look at a close-up of the activation, and we get another interesting cue. Um, I've shown you this nice linear curve. This is, for instance, in the anterior superior temporal sulcus. And you can see directly this is the bold activation function. These are in seconds, and these are the actual measures from fMRI. So you can see that the bold response, which relates to the oxygenation of the bold, uh, of the blood, sorry, is uh, increasing with constituent structure. But um, notice that the scale here is not a linear scale. It's a log scale. And what we find is a linear increase as a function of the logarithm of the constituent, of the number of constituents in uh, the structure, approximate number of constituents, number of words that can be integrated in constituents, I should say, carefully. So we're not sure what that means, but it's not exactly what we, what we predicted. And uh, the model that I showed you, if it is true at all, will have to be revised a little bit to account for this. We have to consider that the new words that are coming in do not add linearly to the structure, but there is a sort of uh, compression, if you want, or maybe predictive coding is one possibility, whereby new words do not contribute nearly as much marginal activation on top of the old ones. And um, if there is one day an understanding of the neural code for a uh, syntactic structure, it will have to account for this logarithmic encoding. Points to a way that the sentence is compressed together when it's, when it's possible to create constituent structure. Now, the second prediction, if you might remember, was that there should be a temporal delay. And this you can already see here. You can see that when we present a list of words, we get small activation, and it's early. And as we present more and more structure, we get slower and slower activation here. As you can, I, I think you can see this directly with your eyes. Now, we can study this more carefully. And I would like to say here something important, which is that many people think that fMRI is not sensitive to temporal structure, that it is a method without any temporal resolution. If we use this sort of method, we can fit this, the activation by a sinusoid, extract the phase, we get actually a temporal precision on delays of activation on the order of 200 milliseconds. 200 milliseconds is not too bad. It's close enough to psychological times. And when we do that, we find that uh, essentially all of the areas that I've shown you show an increase of their phase uh, as predicted by uh, the little model I show you. So they get slower and slower as we present more and more constituent structure. This is uh, not true for the orbital part for a reason that we don't understand. Notice that phase is also an absolute measure. Here we present it in seconds. And so we can say that to some extent there are some areas that respond faster than others. Uh, these areas may be involved early in the computation and the inferior frontal part is much slower and especially the orbital part has the slowest latency of all. And this also points to a very systematic organization of the system, although we don't fully understand it. We've seen it in many different experiments. This is another experiment where we had people listen to sentences. And you can see very clearly in this color code for the phase that the speed of response of the system, even when measured with fMRI, is not at all homogeneous. But there are systematic delays such that the fastest response is seen around the auditory cortex. Then there is a slower response in the auditory belt areas and then slower still in the superior temporal sulcus, and especially in the anterior and uh, much more posterior part. And finally, the slowest response of all are in the inferior frontal gyrus. So there is a sort of cascade of processing that we don't fully understand again, but which points to a sort of serial organization, possibly loops in the system. Very interestingly also, and I'm sorry, this talk will be all like that. I will give you cues, but I don't have the final answer. I hope someone puts together all the cues. But this is a spectacular image here that was produced by my wife, Gislaine de Anne Lambert, in two months old babies. 
And in two months old babies, already we find this temporal structure when babies listen to a sentence. They listen to a short sentence and already you can see the phase coding suggests fastest response around the primary auditory area and slower along the temporal lobe, slower also going backwards into the angular gyrus and slowest of all in the inferior frontal area. And the inferior frontal area is already activated by spoken language in a two months old baby. So that means that there is an organized system with an organized property of uh, the speed of its response, a churning machine which is already being able to be activated specifically by uh, spoken language. And although, of course, there is no syntax at that age probably, uh, there is already the machine which is perhaps already compiling and chunking uh, the input. And this sort of temporal organization, we may speculate, might already be allowing the baby to segment and to analyze the speech stimulus at different scales that might be relevant to parsing. So we were very interested in these temporal properties of the language network. And uh, I want to show you one experiment that we just published very recently with Lorian vagar in whom, in, in which we studied uh, the response of the system as we compress speech. An old love, actually, of Jacques Meller, who taught us that we could compress speech 25 years ago, I guess. Uh, so um, the idea was very simple. We have this temporal property that different areas respond at different speed. Is this a structural property of the system, or can we change it by increasing the speed of the input? We know that we can compress speech either visually by accelerating the RSVP, the rapid serial presentation, or by compressing the audio stimulus. Would we change the properties of the system? Would we accelerate the processing or would we not? So we scanned FM subjects with fMRI while they were either listening or reading uh, sentences that were presented either at 100% normal rate or at compressed versions, 80%, 60%, 40%, 20%. We started with recording a sentence at a normal, relatively fast speaking rate, and then we compressed it. And this is the behavioral intelligibility of the sentence as rated by the subject. Um, and you can see that essentially, as reported in many papers, including some of Jacques' paper, we can compress speech up to about 50%, sometimes 40% of its original duration and intelligibility is maintained for a long time with a little period of adaptation which we provided here. So essentially intelligibility remains the same and then suddenly there's a collapse around 40% here. Uh, and subjects uh, eventually no longer understand the content of the sentences. So with this tool in hand, we wondered what are the areas that show an acceleration, what are the areas that don't show an acceleration, and what are the areas that show a collapse. So what I'm going to show you is a very simple parsing of the system, makes sense, but I think again it points to an interesting temporal property, suggests that fMRI can measure temporal properties. So let's look at something very simple, the auditory area around Heschel's gyrus. Here you can see something very clear. This is a unimodal area, it's not responding to visual presentation of sentences, it is responding to the spoken language presentation, and its response diminishes and accelerates as we compress the speech more and more. Right? We present a shorter auditory stimulus and we see a correspondingly linear shortening of uh, the bold response. Similarly, in the occipital uh, cortex and a big chunk of the ventral visual pathway, you can see the converse phenomenon, a response to written but not spoken language, and an acceleration as a function of the duration of presentation. Now, what is very striking is that all of the language areas that I showed you in these first slides do not show this effect of compression. Instead, they show no change and then a collapse. So we can look, for instance, at the posterior superior temporal sulcus here, and you can see the whole length of the superior temporal sulcus being labeled by this analysis. What do we see? First of all, we see bimodal activation. These are areas that care about the structure, but not the modality of input. They do not care whether the language is presented visually or auditorily. Second, they do not change their profile of activation with compression. They cannot be compressed. You see, they keep the same profile of activation for the first four levels of compression, up to 40%. There's a little bit of acceleration for 40%, and then you can see there's a collapse precisely correlated with the subject's lack of intelligibility. So, Early areas are compressed, 
but the language system as a whole does not seem to be submitted to this compression. It seems to be churning speech at its own internal rate, temporal rate, and um, suddenly, perhaps because it can no longer track the uh, coming inputs which come at their own rate, it collapses suddenly. And this is the model that we have proposed, essentially, that there are three sorts of areas. There are the sensory areas that show a linear variation. There are all of the, I would say, interesting language areas of the left hemisphere along the STS and inferior frontal gyrus that show this collapse pattern, so no change and then a sudden collapse. And there are a few other areas, all in the frontal and cingulate areas, that show an intermediate peak. They work more and more for the difficult conditions of compression. When there is a difficulty, because the input is coming closer and closer together, and then uh, they also collapse when you move to a too short duration to be understandable. What is happening there is compatible with the idea that the spoken language system is autonomous. It works, it resists temporal compression, it seems to have its own internal temporal dynamics, a series of stages that run along their own temporal time course, cannot be accelerated, and therefore what happens during language compression is that we have a buffer, we let words enter into the buffer, we have all of these frontal areas coming up more and more, they correspond very nicely to a model of a possible buffer, and if too many words come in, so that you cannot pile them out of this buffer, then you suffer from a complete collapse of intelligibility. But meanwhile, your language system is still churning words at the maximal rate that it can afford. So I hope I have shown you that we can begin to say some things about the temporality of operations in the brain. It's not completely resolved yet. And this is a summary slide of what we found in the original experiment with Christophe Pallier with the normal prose versus Jabberwocky, just to get a strong impression of these networks in red that show an augmentation of activity, an increase of activity as a function of the constituent structure of language. Normal prose, you can see the entire system. Jabberwocky, you see these three sets of areas. I want to draw your attention to one fact which I have left for the moment aside, which is that there, are, there is an equivalent number of areas, in fact quite extended, that are in green that show the converse variation. They show a decrease in activation. In other words, they show more activation when we show a list of words compared to when we present structured stimuli all the way up to a sentence. And they correspond to a very broad parieto frontal network that we see in many effortful tasks. So you could say there is an effort and are trying to maintain the representation for something that you can't quite pass. But I would like to point out that when we are analyzing the constituent structure of language, well, the language areas show an increase, but maybe it is the other areas that are equally important in structuring the stimulus, and I, I'll come back to that. So first of all, can we replicate these findings? Can we understand the limits of the findings? Well, the first obvious thing was, is it true also for spoken language? So Christophe Pallier generated with Elodie Covey this very nice auditory stimuli, uh, they are the same logic. We work with powers of two because at that time we knew that there was a log uh, to be found there. So we, uh, we worked with one, two, four, eight, or 16 word constituents. They, uh, we recorded the stimuli and uh, the manipulation that was done here was to remove prosody by presenting the words as if they were in isolation, but of course trying together to form a sentence. So prosody was removed and there was no uh, confound with prosody here. Um, we had a minimal task, detect a local change in the speaker, and basically, to present things very quickly, we found exactly, virtually the same exact network with spoken language as with written language. I can show this to you here. This is the written language condition. This is the spoken language condition. You see that all of the relevant language areas, again, are being activated. There's a little bit less activation of this uh, posterior superior temporal sulcus region here, which perhaps plays a role of interface with the reading system, but even that region is activated and shows a linear increase, and also the decreases are continue to be present in this bilateral network that involves prefrontal, cingulate, and parietal nodes. So very close replication. Obviously, the areas that we are interested in that uh, correspond to constituent structure of language, they do their job visually as well as auditorily. They are at an amodal level. That's to be expected, I think. This is a sort of curve that we can get out of these experiments. So 
Uh, again, this is the bold effect. The, the sentence now is very, very slow. It extends over a period of about six seconds. You can see zero here, six seconds is here, and you can see this very slow increase that lasts longer and comes higher up for the uh, more structured constituents compared to the non-structured uh, constituents. This is sort of data we have. It's not perfect in order to uh, decode the system. And you can see an example of this converse uh, pattern here, which is generally a pattern of deactivation, which shows the monotonic pattern in the opposite direction as well. Now, we are in the process of extending these replications and extensions to a variety of stimuli. I just wanted to mention the ongoing work in the laboratory of Antonio Moreno and Christophe Pallier to try to see if sign language would obey exactly the same sort of organization at the brain level. So uh, the experiment is very, very simple, we, but required the generation of complex stimuli, of course. Uh, we generated the same sort of stimuli with uh, sign, French sign language using eight word sentences, uh, or eight sign sentences, if you'd like. Uh, and in one condition, therefore, we juxtapose eight different signs. Then there were four groups of two signs, two groups of four signs, and finally eight sign sentences, so four different levels. Um, the task was, again, simply to understand these sentences, but of course we are calling in uh, deaf uh, viewers that for whom it is uh, the native language. This experiment is just starting, so I won't show you definite results. I want to show you one of the stimuli. I don't know if there are any speakers of French language, French sign language here. Um, you can try to guess which, which condition it is. So, this was actually a list of words, but the sentence would be exactly the same. For those of us who don't speak sign language, it's impossible to know which is which, actually. So that's a, that's a nicely controlled stimulus. You've noticed that we fuse the stimuli together and shorten them and so on so that they form a sort of list of words, actually. But to a speaker, some of these stimuli are understandable and form constituents. Um, now, the experiment, as I said, is ongoing now. We only have a few pilot data, but I could not resist inserting this slide, which is showing you the very first pilot subject was scanned by Antonio. And uh, you can see, essentially, the whole network is showing up already. Uh, these are all the areas that show linear increase as a function of constituent structure in the left hemisphere. You can see very strong organization along the superior temporal sulcus. There is very nice inferior frontal activation. There might be changes in lateralization. We will see that. There might be additional areas as well, but it looks like uh, we might be in a condition to uh, replicate and show that the same network, as expected, I would say, is, is uh, involved in sign language. Now we are in a position to explore these other domains of cognition that Hauser, Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch talked about at the beginning. So what about music? What about mathematics? So we start with a very simple experiment on music. Again, this is ongoing work. It's done by Elodie Cove for a PhD thesis. It's not published yet. But we are all inspired by Lerdel and Jackendorf's idea that uh, classical tonal music uh, can be organized according to metric and tonal structures. Um, so. Um, we thought that we could mimic our language manipulation by progressively disassembling a musical stimulus into its individual constituents and make them smaller and smaller. So what we did was start with Mozart pieces and uh, progressively shuffling them into smaller and smaller pieces. Um, I'm going to have you listen to this. It's a little bit of torture maybe, but we'll, oh, especially if it doesn't work. Huh. I'm not sure why I have this. Let me see. This is actually fake Mozart, but it's, it's a little bit of Mozart, but it's arranged so that it will be only four bars. Okay. Can you hear it? I can't make it louder, I'm afraid. Um, so now let's decompose it. So here there were clearly two chunks, right, in different tonalities. That's something we are correcting in new experiments. Right? So here four pieces. And now it becomes so deconstructed. It's not so bad. It could be part of the part of the problem is that with uh, you know contemporary music we've become used to the idea that anything can be a sentence basically. 
So it's it's worse than Jabberwocky in a certain sense, but uh, still we give we ask ratings from people, and they all agree that there is more structure and there is linearly more structure in these stimuli uh, when we give them a scale, for instance. And this is true of musicians as well as non-musicians. So we do this experiment, and what do we find? Well, the first result was disappointing. So now we have 40 subjects, half of whom are, mu are musicians, and so it's a powerful experiment. And uh, if we ask for linear increases as a function of this manipulation, we find very scarce activations at the normal threshold, 10 minus 3. However, if we lower the threshold a little bit, then we see interesting activity appear, and it's not random at all. It does appear in uh, the superior temporal sulcus. The exception is that there is a lot of it on the right side. There is a right temporal pole that we also saw for language. Um, there is a uh, left inferior frontal region in the orbitalis part, and again, it tends to be more bilateral. There is this more opercular part, which gets activated. So, uh, in a certain sense, it's a weaker and more bilateral version of part of the network that we saw for spoken language. A bit disappointing, but um, still, when we make a focused analysis, it looks like the uh, language areas can be contributing to music, and uh, as others have reported, one way to analyze it is uh, to look specifically for regions of interest. There is an interesting approach that's been developed at MIT by F. Fedorenko, which is to look inside the regions of interest that we have, uh, in fact, localized with previous uh, studies. And we've added here Broadman Area 44, which comes up in many studies. And within those voxels, you can search for, in a given subject, in one particular subject, you can search first for which voxels are concerned with language and then within those voxels for this individual subject, you look for the activation for music. This is a very powerful approach because it means that you have a high spatial specificity precisely for those voxels that care about language, but also that you have a very uh, good statistical sensitivity because you're only testing seven or, in this case, eight areas. So you can lower your statistical threshold. The correction would, would be less drastic as for the whole brain. And when we do this, what we find is that uh, the musicians certainly show an activation, and it does include precisely the areas that we found for Jabberwocky as being activated. So the two, inferior frontal, orbitalis, and triangularis part, in fact, Broadman's area 44 is also activated with some variability, and uh, the posterior superior temporal sulcus is activated. And as you saw in the picture, we see the temporal pole as well. Nothing in a temporal parietal junction, which may have much more to do specifically with language. So we do find that a large part of the language network is being activated by the structure of music in people who have the knowledge to extract that structure. In non-musicians, we find very weak activation. Maybe this would become significant with more subjects, but it's very, very weak. Okay. So that's the result yet. It's a little bit ambiguous, but it suggests that there is a modest contribution of language areas to musical syntax exclusively in musicians in our hands, and with the right hemispheric contribution. The results are in large part similar to earlier results, for instance, by Kölsch et al. They do suggest that uh, the inferior frontal gyrus in particular contributes to musical syntax, but it's a weak effect. I would like to stress that once again, we also find these converse effects. And I still don't know what to make of these converse effects, but it's very interesting once again that we have this inverse network very strongly which shows more activation for the destructured stimulus and uh, shows less and less activation, although all of this is negative, so you can see the, the complexity of the interpretation, but uh, you see these negative trends showing up once again bilaterally in the frontal cortex, in uh, the precuneus, in the cingulate, in the inferior parietal region. So uh, is it the positive effects that are the most important or is it the negative effects? Now I want to move briefly to mathematics because, as you know, this has been a topic of interest of mine for many, many years. And, of course, when we look at mathematics, it looks like there is a really important use of nested structures that bear some similarity to natural languages. In some ways, however, of course, mathematical expressions are unique too. Um, this is an expression by Ramanujan, by the way. It's a very famous expression by Ramanujan. I hope you have verified that there is no error there. Um, so, um, of course, the reference of mathematical formulas is a very narrow domain. And also there is this uh, very interesting cultural invention of the expression formula, which allows an extremely complex expression to be depicted by just a few symbols. This is quite unique to mathematics, and it might create its own unique pattern in experts. So we asked in a very uh, early experiment, 
uh, whether mathematical expressions could be quickly parsed and whether the recognition and manipulation makes use of the same brain areas for long linguistic syntax. So first, how do we know that uh, subjects actually quickly parse mathematical expressions? With Mariano Sigmund uh, and his colleagues, we uh, studied the eye movement patterns. When subjects are presented with very simple mathematical expressions, we used here arithmetic expressions so that we could use just the average student who has some knowledge of this uh, uh, parenthesis uh, structure. So you see something like three minus two uh, parenthesis plus four parenthesis plus one or other expressions like this. You don't necessarily need to have the inner parenthesis. We monitor the eye movements and what do we see? This is just one example. It's a single trial actually. Um, where the subject starts here, first eye movement is here, they are ordered by their color, and then you can see that the subject stays in this region, then moves to here, then moves to here, completely excluding the parenthesis. This has been a very systematic finding that eye movements betray in a completely transparent manner the um, structure, the syntactic structures of mathematical expressions, and the very first saccade, if I go back to this picture, the very first saccade is always a little bit to the left of the center, regardless of the structure. But the second saccade is already completely informed about the structure of the expression. So the second saccade is already taking in all of the information. So you can see this here with these different tree patterns of the mathematical expressions. The, the deeper parentheses are here, or they are here, or they are here, or they are here, and time is flowing from top to bottom, and you can see that the eyes of the subject track exactly the structure. Right to left, middle, right, left, middle, left, right. They uh, are extremely quickly aware with the second saccade, the first one that they make inside the expression, of what is the expression of the formula. And this suggests that there is parallel processing of the expression um, such that uh, we can uh, very quickly determine where is the deepest level and put our eyes where it is important, of course, to do the calculation. In this particular study, subjects were asked to perform the calculation. So they were motivated, of course, to pass the expression and do it in the appropriate order. And we could, in fact, find that the duration of all of these stages were proportional to the particular calculation that they were doing at this specific moment, whereas the uh, order of these different saccades solely reflected the syntax. So there was a sort of dissociation between syntax for the order of the eye movements and uh, semantics of the calculation, duration of the specific calculation for the duration of the circuit, duration of the fixation, sorry. So this is evidence that constituent structure can be extracted. Um, we then move to a second experiment where we try to manipulate the depths of arithmetic expressions. This was Ms. Masaki Maruyama. Uh, you can see how we did it. We started with this top level expression similar to the one I just showed. And then we deconstructed it by keeping just two levels, or one level, or zero uh, levels of the original formula. And the rest was just being scrambled so that we would have the same number of stimuli on screen. So that's what our way to control for the visual presentation. So the same exact symbols, but they are shuffled in different orders. We wanted subjects to attend to these structures. And this is difficult because I think it's much less automatic than when you process a sentence. So we gave subject a one back task, which is a classical way uh, to do imaging. So we presented two such sentences, two such formulas, expressions, one after the other. They were both of the same level, so three, two, one, or zero. And uh, the subjects had to decide whether they were identical or not. It was a difficult task that required attention to every possible symbol in the sentence, in the, in the expression, sorry, because we swapped some of the symbols. We could swap two operators or we could swap two digits. I want to show you some behavioral results first to convince you that syntax was indeed extracted in such a task. We designed the task so that it could be performed equally well, I mean, uh, or at least superficially, it could be performed with zero, one, two, or three levels of organization. But in fact, uh, as we expected, subjects were better when the expression was structured. It was easier to do this one back task when the expression was structured. And so even if you look at the same responses, um, you can see that uh, reaction times are faster for the more structured level three, and the error rate drops. And this is true whether it's left branching or right branching. We also have this effect on the different trials. And very interestingly, it is much more true when the operators are swapped. You see this huge effect of structure on the swapping, on the capacity to detect the swapping of two operators, like plus and times. But much less of an effect uh, in uh, the case of swapping of two digits. 
So we suggest that there might already be here a sign of a dissociation between the syntactic structures which cares about parentheses and operators and the more semantic structure filling in with the digit to which the subjects were much less sensitive here in their capacity to detect whether there was a change or not. So this is the behavior, but what about the fMRI activation? We were extremely surprised to find results that were completely different from what we found with language. First of all, there were no areas that show a monotonic activation as a function of uh, the syntax of uh, expressions. On the contrary, what we found is only decreases in activation. And these decreases were in a subset of areas that were completely different from the language areas. And you can see where they are. We have bilateral activations, the lateral occipital cortex and ventral fusiform regions, very strong on the right side. We also have an activation in intraparietal sulcus, which is a favorite area for number processing. We found a lot of activation in this intraparietal sulcus whenever subjects process numbers and do calculation, and also the precentral cortex. In all of these cases, you see this monotonic pattern of deactivation, less activation for more structure. The contrary to what we found for language. So it's a sort of double contrary in a certain sense, right? Very surprising. Are language areas activated at all by mass syntax? We use exactly the same approach as before. We have our eight regions of interest. We search within them. We find the voxels in a given subject that are concerned with language, and then we search these voxels for an effect of mathematical syntax, and we find barely nothing. I mean, there's the tiniest effect in three regions. Uh, it may not be a chance that they are just the three regions that were in red in my original slides. They are the one that activate to Jabberwocky. Here they are again, but you can see the shape of the effect. It's a very, very small effect. It's not really monotonic as a function of the conditions. It varies a lot. And uh, in many cases, uh, it is not active or it is, in fact, deactivated, as you can see, this region, compared to just resting, sitting there. So we don't fully understand what this deactivation means, but at least the pattern is quite different from the pattern seen with language processing. And I have to say that these three regions are significant only because we lower the threshold to 0.05 corrected for the eight regions that we are studying. So it's a very low statistical threshold. Normally, they would not be significant. So this is the picture. We don't really know, but it looks like these areas are making almost no contribution to language. And um, this conclusion, so this is a summary of what we found. I'm going to skip it for time. Um, I would like to suggest that this conclusion actually fits quite well with a lot of the literature. Of course, we know that there is a contribution of language processing to mathematics and especially to arithmetic when it comes to rote verbal knowledge. We have quite a bit of evidence that subjects will learn their mathematical tables, for instance, the table of multiplication using words, and they will, they will have a verbal storage for this sort of knowledge. But when it comes to the syntax of embedded mathematical expressions, there are some really nice dissociations. For instance, uh, Varley and collaborators have reported deeply aphasic patients who are still able to process the syntax of complex algebraic expressions. Um, there is a similar study to ours published by Friedrich and Friedrich in 2009 using some sort of uh, approach of looking for hierarchical structures in mathematics, and they found only the tiniest of activation in inferior frontal gyrus compared to the giant activations that you find in language. It's, it's barely no overlap at all. Instead, just like us, you find a lot of activation in parietal cortex. Um, there is a beautiful study that just appeared by Monty et al., 2012, in which they compare directly in the same subjects um, uh, processing of arithmetic structures and processing of linguistic structures. I, I like this task very much. They ask subjects questions like, okay, why gave X to Z? And then you hear, it was X that Y gave to Z. Did I say the same thing? You have to reason about whether these two sentences have the same meaning. So it's transformation, syntactic transformations of sentences. You can do exactly the same thing in the domain of arithmetic. Y is greater than Z divided by X. X times Y is greater than Z. Did I say the same thing? Is it logically equivalent? When you hear these two sentences and you hear these tasks, it really sounds like, it feels like you're doing the same sort of thing. Right? You're manipulating structures mentally in order to get to compare these two sentences. But when they did the activation study, brain activation study, there is virtually no similarity of the areas involved. The syntactic task, the first task, activates the classical language network, the left hemisphere, the posterior superior temporal sulcus, the inferior frontal region, 
but uh, the arithmetic version, which, by the way, does not involve directly numbers, but does involve arithmetic concepts, um, activates the intraparietal sulcus, and there is some overlap only in the posterior angular gyrus here. So, once again, arithmetical reasoning, even with formulas with X and Y and Z, uh, does not seem to involve the language areas. Instead, what we find is that there seems to be an extremely quick passing of arithmetical expressions by the visual system, and I would like to finish with that. We've replicated our experiments with this other technique called MEG, magnetoencephalography, which allows us to look at the dynamics of activation. And so here we record the signal uh, across uh, the millisecond scale as subjects view these mathematical expressions. And Masaki Maruyama, who did this study, found that basically, even when you see the first expression, within less than 200 milliseconds, around 150 milliseconds, you have this organization of the activation with more and more activation for the structured expression. So this time it is the order that we expected. Uh, arithmetical expressions create more activation in a ventral fusiform gyrus at the very initial process of analyzing these expressions. This is compatible with the eye movement pattern that I showed you earlier. It suggests that in these subjects who have some mathematical training, mathematical expressions of this level of simplicity are analyzed entirely in parallel and already within 150 milliseconds, the visual system has some structured, hierarchically, well, I would say monotonically organized uh, activation that betrays uh, processing of the, of the structure of these expressions. We also find uh, this positive effect of expression complexity a little bit later in the parietal lobe, and so we can confirm that there is a sort of sequence of processing from the ventral visual areas to the parietal lobe. So, Really, it seems that mathematical expressions are different. They bypass the language system. They are compiled into the visual areas. In fact, we have an effect even earlier in the visual system. This was an unexpected finding, but you remember that we have these left branching and right branching expressions, which means that the deepest level of parenthesis can be on the left or on the right. Well, this creates a retinotopic effect. We are now at the occipital pole within retinotopic cortex, and the location of the parenthesis creates this lateralized activation. There is more activation on the side of the parenthesis. And we find this for two levels. We, it looks like we have the reverse finding here, but what that means is that even within a destructured expression, they are sometimes opening and closing parenthesis like this, and uh, they will create an activation on the contralateral hemiphil, a retinotopic activation. So, I suggest here that maybe this is yet another example of what I have called neuronal recycling. The fact that in our culture, in our invention, such as the invention of the symbolic notation with parenthesis, we are making use of devices that are present in the brain for a long time. And in this case, I wonder whether it's the integration of visual contours, which is something that exists in primates and many mammals. Uh, in the visual cortex, early visual cortex, you have this capacity to connect receptive fields with uh, compatible orientations and to very quickly extract regions such as this ellipse here that pops out, okay? Well, the suggestion is that maybe parentheses and other notations such as the cartouche of the Egyptians is making use of this property of the visual system because it helps that for important information to pop out and therefore it would not be chance if our parentheses are opening and closing and not the converse. It's not a convention, it's a property of the visual system that we are making use of which amplifies the activation in the early visual cortex. But it has nothing to do, of course, with the syntax of language. It is a device that we make use at the earliest visual level to help with the parsing of these expressions. So I'm reaching my conclusions, um, and the conclusions will be in two parts. The first part is an reasonably optimistic message on the neural coding of language syntax. Using brain imaging techniques, we are making some progress in characterizing the neural code for the constituent structure of language. There is converging evidence for a core network. Three areas are well localized. We can see them in every single subject. They are interconnected. We know their interconnections, so the arcuate and uncinate fasciculi. We know that they are crucial also from lesion studies. So there's beautiful converging evidence from Laurie Tyler, for instance, showing that if you are looking across a broad array of patients with left hemisphere lesions all over the place, and you ask what, what is the correlation of the lesion site with the score in a syntactic test, that's exactly what you find, the same exact set of core areas that are, be, if lesion, will create a syntactic deficit. 
we begin to unveil the parametric variations and temporal dynamics of that system, even with a coarse tool like fMRI. And uh, constructing an ST3 takes surprising long time. There is an incompressible time, even if we compress the input, we can't compress the internal time. I think we can analyze this with fMRI, but in the future, of course, we'll have to analyze this with much more precise tools, MEG, and perhaps intracranial signals, and the fact that it is now possible in many human subjects with epilepsy to study intracranial recordings and even single neuron recordings or populations of single neurons in the future in these areas means that I think we will be able to make a lot of progress. I just want to mention that there is a lot of converging evidence. For instance, this is from Angela Frederici's lab. She's been using the same sort of manipulation with uh, centrally embedded structures and she's finding that the left pars opercularis is showing this very strong effect of uh, syntactic structures. There are many experiments of this kind, some by Andrea Moro, who is here as well. Um, we are also finding with genetics that this system may have a particular evolution in the human brain. And I think this is an important tool that in the future will help us analyze the system. So I think you all know the FOXP2 story, that there is this gene that has a number of very recent modifications only in the human lineage. And in this paper by Philippe Pinel in the laboratory, we've been able to show that there are polymorphisms in the normal population, not patients, just the normal population. We all have some polymorphisms on the genome. There are some polymorphisms on FOXP2 here and here that modulate the activation of the language areas, and especially this part here, right in inferior frontal gyrus, is showing this very clear modulation of activation during reading as well as during speech listening as a function of this polymorphism. So we begin to be able to dissect the mechanisms. You may know that they are now humanized mice, which means that they have the human version of the FOXP2 gene. This is from the lab of Zante Pabo. And uh, with this sort of research, I think we can begin, of course, with all sorts of cautions, to analyze the effects that genes have on the system. It won't be a speaking mouse, I think. It won't, have a, it won't be a mouse with language, but it may help us understand what sort of molecular and ultimately neuronal properties have changed and allowed the system to become recursive. Now I come to my second conclusions, so second piece of conclusion. A surprising divergence between language and mathematics. Recursion in mathematics seems to engage other non-linguistic regions of the brain, particularly ventral, visual, and parietal areas. There is nice convergence with other fMRI studies. It fits also with the intuitions of many mathematicians, such as Einstein, for instance. Einstein said, words and language, whether written or spoken, do not seem to play any part in my thought processes. The psychological entities that serve as building blocks for my thought are certain signs or images, more or less clear, that I can reproduce and recombine at will. It's not really evidence, but it's an interesting suggestion that maybe this is on the right track. What can we conclude from this about the Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch proposal? I think we still have results that are compatible with three models of human recursion. First, there is still the possibility of a linguocentric model. Maybe Lee Spelke is an advocate of this model, which would claim that all human combinatorial operations derive from the language faculty. But then they can be automatized, they can be compiled. And maybe this is what happened to the number system, that it starts in the child, if we could study it when children learn it, learned algebra, we would see a lot of activation in the language system and then it would be pushed and compiled into early visual areas. There's a second possibility, which is what I call the workspace model, which is the idea that it's not language which is at the center, but language, mathematics, and other human capacities may derive from the evolution of a new coding scheme in a distributed system called the global workspace, which involves to a large degree prefrontal cortex, associated areas, that may have had a new type of code in the human species. And that's why I was stressing so much all of these negative activations of the prefrontal cortex, because they might be indicating to us a sort of systematic process of searching for organization within these prefrontal cortex areas, and that is in fact, to a large degree, what was common to the different paradigms that I showed you today. But in this case, language would be derivative on another faculty. Finally, there is a third possibility, which I also view as very interesting. I put Josh Tenenbaum here with a question mark, because he's been, pro he's been proposing some of these ideas, but not all of them, I think. But you know that there is the view that many brain areas, if not all of them, implement a sort of Bayesian learning algorithm. That they have a sophisticated mode of extracting information and they all apply a similar sort of algorithm for statistical learning. And Josh Tenenbaum makes the hypothesis 
that in humans, the hypothesis space which is being searched by this process includes recursive structures. So there is a possibility that maybe a mutation created within each or many brain areas, within the layered structure of cortex, for instance, a new possibility to look for new types of structures. And that would be shared just because it's replicated all over the cortex, this ability to look for structures in vision, in mathematics, in language, and so on. So I think now we have three well-identified possibilities, and uh, it's only a matter of finding the more clever experiments. I think it's only, of course, a very core start where we are now. But uh, I hope that maybe uh, 10 years, 25 years, we come back here and we'll have the answer. Thank you very much for your attention. Five minutes for questions. Mm. <laughs> yes, well, thank you, Luigi. Uh, I totally agree. We, we are looking forward to uh, contribution of linguistics will be sufficiently simple that everybody would agree on what is the number of merge operations. And that, I think there is a difficulty here because there is a variety of syntactic theories or linguistic theories. Uh, but maybe there is only one which is important. Uh, <laughs> so, but I, I totally agree. I, we know that it's not the number of words that count. In fact, we have in the drawers an experiment where we would compare English and French, for instance, and we know that we can express the same sort of internal deep structures, if you'd like, with very different numbers of words. Uh, so uh, I think this is typically the kind of experiment that can be done. And I, I guess, I, but we discussed it, but I think we can do experiments where the entire syntactic structure would be conveyed by a single word. So that would remove a lot of the problems with designing these experiments as a sequence of stimuli. Um, um, yeah, and this would also allow greater comparability with the mathematical stimuli. So I think we, we can do such an experiment. I should mention that there are many experiments on morphology, and they do point to a contribution of the inferior frontal cortex uh, to morphological operations on words. And I'm very sensitive to the idea that morphology and syntax may share a lot of the same mechanisms. And it looks like that at the brain level to some extent. So, so this would be something very interesting to pursue. OK, look, a short one. Mm-hmm. 
so I'll start with the second question. I think, it, in fact, it's part of this workspace ID that I'm playing with that there is automatization. Uh, we start with a system of prefrontal areas that is there for effortful learning with attention. And progressively, we would automatize and compile the corresponding structures in other areas. Automatization leaves the, the, let the stimuli leave, essentially, from the prefrontal cortex. So there is an interesting possibility that language learning involves a form of automatization of this kind. Uh, and it would find the appropriate structures in a temporal lobe, maybe because they have these nested temporal structures already, as I showed you, in a baby. So uh, at some level, this recycling view of language has to be true, right? The language areas did not come out of the blue. In fact, they have a lot of organization, which is somewhat similar to what you find in the hierarchy of uh, synapses coming from the auditory cortex to higher areas in the primate, in other non-human primates. So yes, that's one possibility is this notion of a compilation, even for the language, uh, for the spoken language. And uh, the, the, what was your first question? Am I? Oh, for Jabberwocky, yes. We haven't done the experiment, so I can't say. Uh, all of the three areas that were active for Jabberwocky showed this pattern of incompressibility. So I would expect that we would essentially replicate the results with the additional difficulty, of course, that it's difficult to attend to these very fast RSVP sentences if they are not understandable. So we would have to maintain attention on the subjects. Maybe you can just speak uh, loud. Oh, it seems to be working. Oh, yeah. Um, since you've tried to test the activation on the sign language, I would like to know if you ever tried with Braille written language for hmm. blind people. No, we have not. No, uh, I would expect that Braille will make use of the same exact structures, including the reading areas. And uh, maybe I'll mention very briefly here that there is absolutely stupendous work by Amir Ahmedi in Israel, and we are collaborating a little bit, but he has been showing that braille reading makes use not only of the early visual cortex, which is surprising, but in the early blind they use their early visual cortex. So it's a sort of extreme form of recycling. They are recycling their visual cortex for touch. But when they read, as opposed to just touching an object, they activate specifically the visual word form area. And when uh, they learn to see by Audition, there is a device that substitutes vision by audition, so they can learn to see things by hearing sounds. When they recognize letters with this device, they specifically activate the visual word form area. So, and, and differently from when they recognize a house or recognize an object, for instance. So, uh, again, this is stupendous results showing there is structure in the system. It's not any brain area that can do braille reading. It's a very specific set of areas. They are very similar to what you do when you read with your eyes, basically. So I have two related questions about the experiments about constituent structure. First, you said that the sentences were made flat, but you also said unintonated. So they were made only unintonated or totally flat? Well, the words were intonated, but they were recorded in isolation, if I remember correctly. Uh, so that you would uh, wanted to see syntactic structure without the phonological cues to it. Exactly, because we didn't want that to be a difference between the different conditions. because. I mean, another way which we are using now, uh, it seems to give exactly similar results, is to have the whole set of stimuli recorded by someone who pretends that they are sentences. So we have now these recordings where you have the full prosodic pattern of a sentence, even though it is a list of words. Right? It's difficult to record this, but we, you can record it. So we have now scans of this new condition. It seems to, uh, in fact, work better as a localizer of the same areas, as you would suggest, I suppose, because prosody helps exactly. uh, in the parsing. And the related question is sign language. As you said that uh, those, um, those uh, words, so those signs that you showed, to me, were clearly signs in isolation. Uh -huh. And I'm sure that if you make tests of discrimination, everybody will recognize a real sentence from a list of words. No, 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 but the stimuli were recorded in this way even when they made a sentence. Uh -huh. uh, so it's exactly like the spoken ah, version. So when they were not made flat. Uh, well, they, they, uh, what the, the way that it was recorded was that the person would make one sign, 
and then go back to the neutral okay, position. Okay, okay. Make another sign, go back to the neutral. Can we, and we splice it together so that it was closer in time to okay. save time, basically. Yeah. Okay. So the, the conditions did not differ in that respect. So the parallels completed that was spoken then? Somewhat, okay. yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, I think I wish we have to stop sure. here, otherwise we lose uh, a coffee break or a lunch break. Anyway, thank you again. Thank you very much.